A subset C of Rn is called a cone if for every x in C, C contains all the non-negative scalar multiples of x. For example, the following set is a cone. We can see this by looking at a sketch of the set. So the set is given in red in this sketch. If we pick an element here, then all non-negative scalar multiples of this element will lie along this ray. And if we pick an element here, then all non-negative scalar multiples of this will lie on this ray. So this is a cone. In the context of what we have been doing, we'll be interested in a special family of cones called polyhedral cones. We say that a cone is polyhedral if it is given by the set of x in Rn such that Ax is greater than or equal to 0 for some m by n matrix A. Clearly, if we take an x in this set, all non-negative scalar multiples of x will satisfy these inequalities, so this is a cone. Polyhedral cones are very important in understanding the structure of polyhedra. In particular, the following result is quite useful. So if C is a non-empty subset of Rn, then C is a polyhedral cone if and only if there exists d1 up to dk in Rn, where k is a positive integer, such that C can be written as lambda1 times d1 plus all the way up to lambda k times dk, where lambda1 up to lambda k are non-negative real numbers. We're going to give a sketch of this proof. First, we prove sufficiency. So suppose that our set C can be written like this for some d1 up to dk. That means x is in C if and only if there exists lambda1 up to lambda k such that the following hold. So this is a system of linear constraints. If we treat lambda1 up to lambda k and all the entries in x as variables, we have a system of linear constraints involving such variables. So we can apply fourier moskin elimination to eliminate lambda1 up to lambda k to obtain a system that will involve only the x variables. And the system will define precisely the elements x that are in C. Also, in the final system, the constant term must be zero because if you look at these constraints here, and since there is no constant term in any of these, after applying fourier moskin elimination, none of the inequalities will have a constant term. And so C can be defined by a system of linear inequalities of this form, therefore C is a polyhedral cone. We now prove the other direction. Suppose that C is a polyhedral cone given as follows. We're going to construct these Ds. First, let's C prime denote the following set. By what we have just proved, C prime is a polyhedral cone. So that means there exists d1 up to dk for some positive integer k such that C prime is a set of x in Rn satisfying these inequalities. And now we're going to show that with this d1 up to dk, we can write C as this set here. First of all, we make the following claim. If you take u in C and v in C prime, then u transpose v, or v transpose u, is at least 0. And this is easy to check from the way C prime is defined. Let's take an element x prime, such that x prime is lambda 1 d1 plus all the way to lambda k dk for some non-negative lambda 1 up to lambda k. And we want to show that x prime is in C. And to do this, we just need to show that x prime satisfy all these inequalities. Now let's concentrate on this. Since c prime contains any of these aj, aj must satisfy all these inequalities, and so we can say that this quantity here is going to be at least zero. And since lambda j is now negative, we can conclude that this sum here is going to be non-negative. And that implies that x prime is in C. So what that means is we have shown that C contains this set over here. Now we need to show the reverse inclusion. And we'll do this by contradiction. So suppose that the following system has no solution. Then using a variant of the Farkas lemma, we have a y in Rn 
such that y transpose di is at most zero for i from one up to k, and y transpose x prime is greater than zero. Now from this, we see that di transpose times minus y is at least zero for i from one up to k. And so minus y is going to be in c prime. But this here says minus y transpose times x prime is less than zero. But x prime is in c. So this contradicts our claim here. And so this supposition is false. And that completes the proof. Now let's go back here to see why such a y exists. If one does not want to use Farkas lemma, one can see this by linear programming duality. So if we look at this linear programming problem, the dual is the following. Notice that y identically 0 is a feasible solution, and the primal problem is infeasible. This problem must be unbounded. And so we can find a feasible solution, then make this as large as we want, and in particular we'll make this positive. And that establishes the existence of y satisfying these conditions.